Now we're ready to define conditional probability. Let's take any two events A and B under the assumption that the probability of B is positive. Then the conditional probability of A given B is defined as follows. The probability of A given B is equal to the quotient probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. If B has zero probability, then this conditional probability is not defined. Okay, here's one example. We're gonna roll one die, six-sided die, and let X be the value that we get. As before, X can be anywhere from one to six. Each of outcome has probability one sixth. Let's consider the two events. A is the event that X is a six, and B is the event that X is even. So we can compute directly. The probability of A given B is the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. So the probability of A intersect B, of course, A intersect B is A itself, which is probability of one sixth. The probability that B is even, there are three out of six even numbers, so that's one half. So the conditional probability is one third. Let's think of another example. Let's say we're gonna roll two dice. X1 and X2 are going to be their values. And let's define Y to be the sum of the two dice. We can first ask the question, what's the probability that the first die had a one given that the sum is three? Well, note of course, that the only way for the first die to have a one and the sum to have a three means the second die was a two. So the probability of this event is the probability of x1 equals 1 and x2 equals 2 divided by the probability y equals 3. So what is the probability that x equals 1 and y equals 2? Well, there's one such outcome in the sample space, so that's 1 out of 36. The probability that the sum equals 3, of course, there are two ways to do that, 1, 2, and 2, 1, so that's 2 out of 36. That quotient gives us 1 half. But let's flip that around. What's the probability that y equals 3 given that x equals 1? Well, notice the numerator is the same, but now the denominator is different. So the numerator is still 1 out of 36, but the denominator is now 1 sixth. So the ratio is 1 sixth. Notice that these are not the same. The probability of a given b and the probability of b given a are not guaranteed to be the same number. Okay, now let us define the notion of independence. So we say that two events are independent if the probability of the intersection is equal to the product of the probabilities. Specifically, the probability of A intersect B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Now, why do we call this independent? Well, notice the following calculation that we'll go through. If both of these have positive probabilities so that all the conditional probabilities are well-defined, under the assumption of independence, the probability of A given B is just the probability of A. The probability of B given A it's just the probability of B, meaning that knowing that A occurs does not give us any update to the information as to whether or not B occurs. And that's a good notion of independence. Finally, we can define random variables being independent, which simply means that they're independent given any values. Specifically for any K and L, the probability that X equals K and Y equals L is the probability that X equals K times the probability Y equals L. Okay, now we're ready to state the law of total probability. It goes like this. Let's assume that we have a partition of the sample space. Specifically, we have sets A1 through AN such that their union is all of omega and they are pairwise disjoint. Then, the probability of any event can be written as the following sum. The interpretation of this sum is that to compute the total probability of an event, we can compute all of the conditional probabilities against this partition as long as we weight those conditional probabilities by the probability of those elements in the partition. Okay, now let's consider the following complicated game. We flip a coin, and depending on the result of the coin, we change what we do in the second round. So in the first round, we flip a coin. If we get a heads, then in the second round, we roll one die. Whereas if we get a tail, we roll two dice and then add those two scores. So what's the probability that the final score is less than or equal to four? We can use the law of total probability here. The probability that X is less than or equal to four is the probability that X is less than or equal to four given a head times the probability of a head, plus the probability of X less than or equal to four given a tail times the probability of a tail. Of course, the probability of a head and a tail are each one half. The probability that X is less than or equal to four given that we have a head is the probability that a single die rolls less than four which of course is four out of six. The probability that two dice added up roll less than four, we have to check this, there's actually six ways that can happen, so the probability is one over six. Adding all those together, we see that the total probability of having a score less than or equal to four is five twelfths. Let's say we have a test for a virus that's 99% accurate. 
Specifically, what that means is the probability of a positive result, given that the person is positive, is 99%. So I can ask, if I get a positive test result, what's the probability that I'm actually positive? It turns out the answer is not necessarily 99%. That's a bit complicated to get. So let's make some notation. We're going to use capital T and capital V to be the status of the test result and the virus being there. Of course, zero is going to represent negative, one's going to represent positive. And so we have these four conditional probabilities. The probability that the test is positive, given that the virus is there, is 99%. The probability that the test is negative, given that the virus is not there, is also 99%, but the wrong test results have a probability of 1%. The conditional probability we're trying to determine is what's the probability V equals 1, given that T equals 1, right? The probability that the virus is there, given the positive test. Note that this is not the probability that T equals 1, given V is 1. When we flip A and B in the conditional, we can get a different answer. So let's go from the definition. We see that the probability that v equals 1 given that t equals 1 is the probability v equals 1 and t equals 1 divided by the probability t equals 1, just by definition. But how do we get that denominator? We can't get that denominator unless we know how common the virus is. So let's assume that the proportion of the population with the virus is alpha, some number between 0 and 1. Then to compute the probability that t equals 1, we'll use the law of total probability. And we can work it out and get this formula. And we get a relatively complicated formula that says the probability that t equals 1 is 1% 1 plus 98% times alpha. Coming from two sources. One of those sources is actually getting the virus, that's the 0.98 alpha term, but there's also this 1% of false positives that pop in. So, putting all this together, the probability that v equals 1 given t equals 1 is the fraction 99 alpha over 98 alpha plus 1. All right, repeating that formula, probability that the virus is there given that the test is positive is 99 alpha over 98 alpha plus 1. And it depends on the prevalence of the virus, which is alpha. So notice, as that prevalence goes to 1, this probability goes to 1. So when the virus is common, a positive test result is reliable. But as alpha goes to 0, the probability goes to 0, meaning that when the virus is rare, positive test result does not have any significance. Now this seems kind of weird, but Let's think of a concrete example. Let's imagine that alpha is 10 to the minus 6, 1 in a million. Let's say the population is 100 million. Well, then about 100 people have the virus. 99 of them are going to get a positive test, and that's going to be correct. But there's going to be 99,999,900 people who are negative, and 1% of them, which is actually just about a million, are going to get a false positive. So you can see the false positive is going to massively overwhelm the correct positives. Not because there's anything wrong with the test, just because there's so many people who are actually negative, the false positives overwhelm the actual signal. This is a significant issue when one's trying to do testing. We don't want false positives. So when we have a rare disease, just indiscriminately testing everybody can actually be counterproductive. I'll end there.